All right. So our next unit of material is really going to level up your synthesis skills. We're going to be starting off looking at oxidations and reductions, redox chemistry. You certainly learned a good bit about redox chemistry in general chemistry. You might remember from Gen Chem that an oxidation is a loss of electrons and a reduction is a gain in electrons. In fact, there are a couple of really commonly encountered mnemonic devices, right, that we, we learn in Gen Chem. There's Leo the Lion Goes Gur, which stands for loss of electrons is oxidation and gain of electrons is reduction. Kind of wordy. I much prefer the way I learned it when I was in college, which is oil rig, right? Really simple and to the point. Stands for oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is a gain of electrons. Now, we can kind of borrow a little bit of that for looking at redox chemistry in organic chemistry, but it's a little bit different. When you studied redox chemistry in, in Gen Chem, we were really looking at kind of literal movement of electrons, like, like taking electrons off of an atom, say like a metal, or putting electrons onto an atom. You think of different oxidation states for something like copper, right? Copper metal that we think of is copper zero. If you oxidize it once, you remove an electron, it becomes copper one plus, <clears throat> remove another electron, and it becomes copper two plus. You are literally removing electrons from the sphere of that, that atom. Now, in organic chemistry, it's a good bit different because we're talking mostly about carbon atoms and other covalently bonded atoms. We don't just rip electrons off of a carbon, typically. But what we do is, in fact, change the electron density on a carbon or other covalently bonded atom. So we can kind of utilize what we talked about in Gen Chem, that idea of losing or gaining electrons, as long as we add one extra word, and that is density, electron density. So in the field of organic chemistry, we look at oxidation as a loss of electron density, and reduction is a gain in electron density. And the way we change the electron density through either oxidation or reduction typically is by manipulating the number of bonds that an atom has to electronegative atoms. So an oxidation to an organic chemist is an increase in the number of bonds to an electronegative atom. Another way to look at it oftentimes is that it often results in a decrease in the number of bonds to, well, non-electronegative atoms, typically hydrogen or occasionally carbon. So an oxidation can, can be one or both of those two things. It doesn't have to be both. Reduction is, of course, just the opposite. When you look at a carbon species, reduction occurs when there's a decrease in the number of bonds to an electronegative atom. And again, typically that results in an increase in the number of bonds to not so electronegative atoms, typically hydrogen, occasionally carbon. So we can talk about different oxidation levels or redox levels in the field of organic chemistry. Now, don't confuse this with true oxidation states. There, there is a way to determine oxidation states for carbon molecules, for carbons, atoms in molecules, but it's overly tedious and really not really that really useful for organic chemistry at the synthetic level. So I prefer to look at it in a much simpler way, which is to use these redox level ideas. And it's really simple. If oxidation and reduction of a carbon species is all about how many bonds to electronegative atoms a carbon has, well, think about it. There's going to be five oxidation levels. You can either have a carbon with, of course, four bonds. You can have a carbon with no bonds to electronegative atoms, or one, or two, or three, or a carbon with four bonds to an electronegative atom. So that's five different states. So what I have here are just some common carbon species that really exemplify the different oxidation levels that we're looking at. Simple things like alkanes, where you just have carbon bonded to hydrogens or other carbons. You know, atoms that are completely non-electronegative, we consider those carbons to be in the oxidation level of zero. No bonds to any of those carbons, right? And again, we're looking at this at, at the carbon, individual carbon level. If you have a carbon bonded to one electronegative atom, like an alkyl halide or an alcohol, then those carbons are in the first oxidation level. Go ahead and attach two electronegative atoms, like two chlorines, in a, in a dihalide, then that carbon is in the second oxidation level. And another really common, in fact, more common way of, of uh, encountering carbons that are in that second oxidation level is in carbonyls, right? Aldehydes and ketones specifically. So here I've got an aldehyde. And it's got two bonds to an electronegative atom, so it's in that second oxidation level.
attach three atoms that are uh, electronegative, you're in that third oxidation level. And really the most common way to encounter that is a carbon that is in the uh, acid derivatives, right? You, here I have a carboxylic acid, but all of your acid derivatives, that carbonyl has three bonds to an electronegative atom, including nitriles, right? And then uh, much less common, we can have a carbon bonded to four electronegative atoms. So here I've got uh, carbon tetrachloride is the old name of this compound here, but also carbon dioxide, right? That has two, carb uh, two oxygens double bonded to the carbon and that makes that in the fourth oxidation level. And then I have this other molecule here. You can see uh, a carbonyl bonded to two nitrogens. This is actually urea and it's another carbonyl type class. But yeah, it has, that central carbon has four bonds to electronegative atoms. So this is the way I'm going to be approaching redox chemistry for this course. This is sort of a synthetic way of looking at oxidation levels rather than proper oxidation states, which again is a lot more complicated. So again, if you're going up in oxidation level, you're oxidizing. If you're going down in oxidation level, then you are reducing. Now, we're gonna start off by talking about specific reductions. And the good news here is that an awful lot of these reactions are reactions you've seen before. In fact, there's almost no new reactions here. It's mostly a collection of chemistry we've seen before with a couple of extra twists here and there. I'm gonna break down reductions into three subcategories, and this is gonna help you learn them and remember them, but also kind of to, to learn what they do or what they can't do necessarily. Because certain kinds, broadly, certain kinds of reductions are really good for certain kinds of transformations, and other kinds of reductions are just not. So let's take a look at something that you're very much familiar with, and that is hydrogenations. Hydrogenation of a pi bond, any kind of pi bond, is technically a reduction. One of the earliest reactions we ever learned was the addition of hydrogen across a carbon-carbon double bond, an alkene, using palladium or some other catalyst. Now, if you look at that transformation, here I've got this alkene going to an alkane. We did not increase the number of bonds to electronegative atoms, but we did increase the number of bonds to hydrogens, right? And that's why this is still technically a reduction. So both of these carbons here on the left have had their number of, of bonds to hydrogen increased. So chemists often refer to hydrogenations as reductions. The same thing is gonna be true when you reduce an alkyne to an alkane in this case. We've increased the number of bonds to uh, hydrogen on both those central carbons. And then the linolar, linolar hydrogenation is really the same idea. We can also hydrogenate other pi bonds. And some of this you've seen and some of this you haven't. We can hydrogenate carbon-nitrogen and nitrogen-oxygen pi bonds as well. Here we've got a nitrile with two carbon-nitrogen pi bonds, and yes, you can hydrogenate those. They're a little bit challenging, but it can be done. Adding hydrogen across both pi bonds, resulting in turning the nitrile into an amine. You can do the same thing to an imine, a carbon-nitrogen double bond, reducing it down to an amine. And now one reaction you've seen before. We talked about this when we looked at aromatic chemistry we can take a nitrobenzene and reduce that nitro group using hydrogenation conditions and turn it into an NH2, an aniline. Occasionally, you will encounter hydrogenating carbon-oxygen pi bonds, but this is pretty unusual. So here I've got, an, say, for example, an ester, and hydrogenating this under really any conditions doesn't generally do anything, just nothing happens. But your more reactive uh, carbonyl compounds like acyl halides can in fact react under certain hydrogenation conditions. So here I have this uh, catalyst, I think we talked about this before, right, when we looked at thioacetals and reducing those down th through what is a, a net deoxygenation. It turns out you can use this same rainy nickel catalyst, which is really just nickel that's kind of very porous and has hydrogen absorbed onto its surface. You can reduce very, very reactive carbonyls like acyl halides down to the alcohol oxidation state. If you look at this, if you look at all of these um, recent reductions, once we get out of hydrogenating carbon-carbon bonds, we are looking at reduction in the purest sense. If you look at the nitrile reduction, that, that carbon of the nitrile went from having three bonds to an electronegative atom to having one bond to an electronegative atom. So it's decreased in oxidation level, so it's been reduced. We've also increased the number of bonds to hydrogen. The imine, the next example, went from two bonds to nitrogen, that's electronegative, to one bond to that nitrogen, et cetera. So here again, when we're looking at these carbonyls, 
uh, the acyl halide being reduced, that carbon neocarbon carbon has three bonds to electronegative atoms, and then in the product has only one. So it's been reduced twice, right, from the oxidation level of three to the oxidation level of one. A variation of this that can be synthetically useful is to reduce an acyl halide specifically using hydrogenation conditions and a special catalyst called Rosenzweig's catalyst. And this is a, a palladium derivative as well. Regardless, it will actually reduce this to an aldehyde, kind of like swapping out the chlorine for hydrogen. If you look at that, we went from a carbon in the third oxidation level with three bonds to electronegative atoms to the second oxidation level, that aldehyde. And that's actually a really challenging thing to do because you might remember aldehydes are pretty reactive in and of themselves. But that can be a really synthetically useful way of, of reducing and getting down to an actual aldehyde. If you look at the bigger picture for the productions using hydrogenation conditions, hydrogenation works really, really well when you're reducing non-polarized pi bonds. If you think about it, a carbon-carbon pi bond is about as non-polarized as you can get, right? Carbon and carbon having the same electronegativity. So it works really well on alkenes and alkynes. If you look at, say, a carbon-nitrogen or a nitrogen-oxygen pi bond, those elements are right next door to each other in the periodic chart. Carbon and nitrogen, right next door to each other. Similar uh, electronegativities. Nitrogen and oxygen, again, similar electronegativities. So those can be hydrogenated as well. A little bit more difficult, but they can be hydrogenated. And that's why carbon yields are really just not terribly easily reduced under hydrogenation conditions, because the CO pi bond is very, very polarized. So it tends to be really, really sluggish in those reactions. It's generally not a good, re, uh, a good way of actually reducing carbonyls, again, with the exception of, of the really reactive ones like acyl halides. So that's just to help you remember when hydrogenation is an appropriate reaction. The less polarized that pi bond is, the more likely it is to work. And the earliest hydrogenations you saw were on essentially non-polarized pi bonds, alkenes and alkynes. All right, so the next category of reductions, and again, you've seen these before as well, some of them, are the metal hydride reductions. We talked about hydride donors before, specifically sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. And so again, a lot of this is going to be review. You can take a carbonyl like a ketone, treat it with sodium borohydride, and it reduces it down to an alcohol. And remember, the sodium borohydride typically only works really well on your more reactive carbonyls like aldehydes and ketones. You can do the same transformation uh, with lithium aluminum hydride. It's a little more aggressive, but it works. Again, here I have a ketone reducing down to an alcohol. And again, see that these are, in fact, reductions. The carbonyl carbon in the starting material is in the second oxidation level, and it's been reduced down to the first oxidation level. That carbon only now has one bond to an electronegative atom. Here I have an ester, and this is review as well. We know that esters can be reduced using lithium aluminum hydride, and that'll give you an alcohol. This works for other acid derivatives as well. Remember that when your acid derivative, something like an amide or a nitrile, when it has a nitrogen in it, when you do a reduction, a hydride reduction on it, it's the nitrogen that kind of hangs around. So here I have this amide being reduced down to an amine using lithium aluminum hydride. So we, we've pointed that out before, but just be aware of that, remember that. So all of that is stuff we've seen before. A couple of variations on this hydride donor chemistry. I'm gonna show you now a couple of new hydride donors. So here I have an ester reacting with a compound called dibaw. I've seen this spelled a couple different ways with an H at the end or an L at the end or, or both actually. Uh, the structure of dibaw is, is drawn over here and it stands for diisobutyl aluminum hydride. And that's exactly what it is. It's aluminum with a hydrogen on it, hence the hydride. And remember, I, I taught you that you can recognize a hydride donor when you have a metal or a metalloid like silicon or boron that has a hydrogen attached to it. And then of course, this just has two uh, branched substituted uh, isobutyl groups attached to it for steric clutter. So this is kind of a special reaction and dibol is actually a, a pretty important synthetic tool you can reduce things like esters and some other uh, acid derivatives using dibaw when you keep it nice and cold to the aldehyde. And that's actually a really challenging thing. I mentioned this before. If you look at that, that reaction, ester going to an aldehyde, both can actually be reduced via uh, a hydride donor. In fact, the aldehyde, the product, is more reactive. So for the 20th time now, we're, we're seeing this example where the product is reactive 
under the conditions that the reactant is going, and it's actually more reactive. It's actually a, a more reactive species than the starting material. So stopping at that aldehyde oxidation state <clears throat> is really challenging. You can't do that with sodium borohydride. It won't work at all, actually. And if you try it with lithium aluminum hydride, well, you can see what happens a couple of reactions above. It's just going to go all the way to the alcohol, that first oxidation level. So stopping at the aldehyde is kind of special. And the way this works, you have to have this sort of special branched uh, alum aluminum hydride and also this cold temperature. Essentially what happens is a hydride is donated onto the ester and breaks the carbon oxygen pi bond. And then it kind of just hangs there. And it, it, normally it would collapse back and, and ex expel out that methoxide, right? That's what acid derivatives do. They kind of do that acyl substitution. And it would, except that if you keep it cold enough and you use dibaw, it will actually kind of hang there but, and not reform the carbonyl right away. That's important because if the carbonyl reforms, then another hydride donor would just come along and react it and you'd wind up with an alcohol. So in this case, the, the cold temperature helps to maintain the stability of that intermediate that uh, has no pi bond in it. And then the big branchy groups on the aluminum help to prevent another aluminum from coming in as well, right? The, the branchy groups kind of bounce off. So that's a dye ball reduction. Another similar reaction that works, as far as I know, only on acyl halides. In fact, I'd done this reaction when I was in grad school is to react an acyl halide with lithium alumino tritrupitoxy hydride. Yeah. So here we've got that compound, again, at a cold temperature. It does really the same idea. It stops at that aldehyde. If you look at the structure of the, the hydride donor, it has aluminum with one hydride attached to it, and then three terp-butoxy groups, which are just big branched groups. <clears throat> it's the same idea we saw with dibob although it's specific now for, for acyl halides. It essentially, because of the cold temperatures, once the first hydride is donated, the aluminum kind of binds to the oxygen, and those big branchy groups kind of prevent it from collapsing back down and prevent another hydride from attacking. And then when you finally work up the reaction, the, the pi bond can reform, but by then there's no hydride around, so it stays at the aldehyde. So a really useful way of, of creating aldehydes. And again, hopefully you can see that these are all, in fact, reductions, where in each case here, decreasing the number of bonds to electronegative atoms. We've got one third category of reductions, and I kind of just call this other. It's kind of a hodgepodge of things, and the good news here is there's nothing new. It's all stuff you've seen before. We're going to start off with the metal ammonia production of an alkyne. Remember, you can take an internal alkyne, treat it with a metal like lithium or sodium, or I've even seen magnesium, in liquid, uh, liquid ammonia, excuse me, and it will in fact do what looks like a hydrogenation. It'll add hydrogens across the pi bond, but it will do it with an anti-stereoselectivity. But again, see how this is a reduction? Uh, we're, we're not changing the number of bonds to electronegative atoms, but the two pi bonded carbons are increasing their number of bonds to not uh, electronegative atoms, hydrogens in this case. We also talked about the deoxygenations, the wolf kushner and the Clemenson reductions. So here I've got just acetone reacting under those conditions. And this is, of course, a reduction, right? We're going from a carbonyl carbon that has two bonds to an electronegative oxygen, so it's in the second oxidation level, and we're turning them into to alkanes, which means that we're going to the zero oxidation level. Do remember, and this actually came up on our, on our exam recently, but do remember that those, oxy those reductions only work on aldehydes and ketones. You can't deoxygenate uh, an ester or an acid or something like that. And then the third deoxygenation, if you recall, was the rainy nickel hydrogenation of uh, thioacetal. And of course, thioacetals can be formed from aldehydes and ketones by reacting them with thiols under acidic conditions. So it's, a, again, a, a net deoxygenation. So as far as reductions go, that's it. A lot of what's here is a review of stuff we've seen before, right? It's sort of just taking a lot of reactions that happen to be reductions and kind of just classifying them as, as such and talking about them again. The new stuff that is here is really just small spin-offs of other chemistry. We introduced the lithium tritropetoxy aluminohydride and the dibaw, and those are in fact really just hydride donors. They're just variations on, on lithium aluminum hydride for the most part. So a lot of just review here. And you notice there's no new mechanisms because most of this is review and a lot of the mechanisms for this chemistry just aren't that well studied.